Good morning, church. I hope y'all are ready to worship today. You're like, where is Eric? I was upstairs. I'm going to do service from up there. Y'all need to turn around and look at the balcony, and I'll preach from up there today. Just kidding. The choir will be that. that the choir will have the best seat today. No, we are filling in some gaps this morning upstairs. If anything goes haywire, uh, you get some crazy feedback, just ignore it, okay? Um, our normal sound guy is playing golf today uh, with Buddy. Come on, guys. And so Kim has graciously decided to try her first attempt at the board today, and she's going to do fantastic. Uh, but just be patient if you hear some squalling or squeaking. I don't anticipate there being any because she is ready to go up there. Um, but welcome. Thank you for being at Bragtown. Welcome to those that are visiting with us today. We do have a special guest, Priscilla. I heard her speak a few weeks back at a Tri-West uh, semi-annual meeting in which she shared her testimony. And her testimony is powerful. And it relates to many of you guys here at Bragtown. And so I invited her to say, hey, look, you've got to come and share this. And she said as she was sitting in the pew thinking about uh, getting up and speaking, she's like, what if somebody asked me to come and share this? And I was like, well, there you go. I asked you to come and share this. Um, and so I'm excited for her to be here. She is a part normally of uh, the Summit Campus at Chapel Hill, right? And so she drove all the way from Pittsburgh this morning to join us to share uh, what the Lord is doing in her life. And so, again, this is Priscilla, and I hope that y'all give her a warm welcome today. Uh, if you will, turn to your bulletins. There's a few announcements that I want to, to make note of. The first is the everyday discipleship training. And again, we have been talking about this for several weeks now, and now is the time for you to make a commitment. I have a sign-up list with the schedule so it will start at 6 o'clock on Friday, June 7th, and on Saturday it will run from around 9 until 4 o'clock. And there is a sign-up sheet behind the schedule. The schedule is here so you have an idea of what it's going to look like, and I hope that you will sign up on the back side. This is going to be huge in your ability to live out Christ in your life and to share the good news of the gospel uh, to others around you. And again, that's a lot of what Priscilla is going to talk about and kind of what the Holy Spirit has been pressing into her from uh, just an evangelistic standpoint. Uh, the second thing on the announcements in your bulletin is June 22nd is our next dental and health bus outreach. That is a Saturday, so it's going to look different from the last time in which we did two evenings. This is going to be from 9 to 5 on Saturday. We're going to have it set up out back. We're going to have several different options in the lower Sunday school class wing, and First Baptist is also going to partner with us that day. So again, I don't have a sign-up sheet for that, but go ahead and plan on at least volunteering for two hours of that day. If you can be here more than two hours, that's awesome, but I would love to see each one of you commit to at least two hours on the 22nd if you're going to be in town. A couple other things I want to note. We have this beautiful thank you card. The Wright School sent this to us. Uh, one of the classes, I believe, uh, provided lunch for them for Teacher Appreciation Week. Grab a, uh, a look at this card. <clears throat> All the staff signed it and how much they appreciate you. Again, some things take place without the whole church knowing, but we provided lunch for Wright School for Teacher Appreciation Week two weeks ago, as well as gift cards and candy to Lakeview School, which are the two schools we partner with. Uh, so those two things happened. We did get a Lakeview card and now the Wright School card. I'm going to sit up there if you would like to take a look at it today. I believe that is all the announcements, so let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll continue with our worship today. Thank you, Father, so much for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for allowing us the ability to get out of bed this morning, to have breath in our lungs, and may our lips therefore testify to your goodness. May we sing praises to your name. May we engage with your word. May we desire to know you more fully. May the Holy Spirit continue to work in our lives in which create a dynamic, active participation within your kingdom here on earth. May we truly desire, as our sign says out front, that we would desire uh, it to be as he like heaven in Durham and that we would continue to further your kingdom here as a church and as individuals within your body. God, guide us. Let not our uh, relationship with you simply be an hour on Sunday mornings, but let it invade our entire lives. Let us all that we do, all that we think, all that we put our hands to be glorifying to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So I'm going to let Priscilla come up and share this morning. And after her, 
I've got a special video from Armenia and an announcement about Armenia. Thank you. A number of you welcomed me well as I join you for worship today and share a bit of my recent hearing of God's commanding and correcting voice of redirection in my life. I'll begin with the words of David in Psalm 66. Come and hear all you who fear God as I tell you what he has done for my soul. Recently, I've been in reconstructive, soul-refining rehab as God firmly called me to a review of my life. Call it the Retirement Disciple Audit. And it revealed the shameful truth that although very present and active in church, I was not personally engaged in the work of sharing Jesus. It has been a challenging journey of rededication, yet one that has led to one of the most freeing, joyous seasons of my life as I finally let go and joined God in gospel work. Do you remember back in 1990 when Henry Blackaby's book with the most incredible title hit our churches? Experiencing God, how to live the full adventure of knowing and doing his will. Wow. The idea of seeing where God was already at work out there and moving to join him was a lightning bolt that captured me and a generation of believers. So recently, I went back to Blackaby's book, trying to see what had inspired and changed me those years ago. And this is what I found. God's invitation to work with him always leads to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. And this, you must make major adjustments in your life to join God in what he is doing. Blackaby wrote to believers in church, us, yet he described this doing the will of God as bringing us, a crisis of belief that required major life adjustments? I thought I was doing the will of God, but there was no crisis of belief or major life adjustments going on. I started wondering, am I missing something? My Bible reading shouted God's answer to my question. Go and make disciples in Matthew. Go into the world and share the gospel in Mark. Paul saying, we are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal to the world through us. And even Jesus, with the heartbreaking description of the people he encountered out there every day, he described them as harassed and helpless sheep without a shepherd. Then he turns to his disciples and says, the harvest is plentiful. It's the workers that are few. The clear example and words of Jesus were not reflected in my comfortable Sunday routines, my weekly plans, or my monthly budget. I was in small group, served whenever asked, read my Bible, gave my tithes and offerings, and loved the preaching. But these commands were about going out of the church with his message, not just putting money in the offering plate so somebody else could do it. In hindsight, my sad, unintentional sin was a slow slide into the good work busyness of a church-loving life. I was hearing God's word about the urgency of the lost out there. I just wasn't personally doing anything out there about it. God was making it very clear to me that gospel sharing wasn't a denominational command or even a general church command. It was a personal disciple command. Instead of the light of the world 
or a light on a lampstand, I realized I was actually the light under the basket. Right in the middle of this soul-searching Blackaby crisis, I heard a local radio ad that inspired me. In the 2000 Sydney Olympics, the eight-man British rowing team won the gold medal. A great shock to everyone. Two years before, as second and third string choices, discouraged, desperate, yet looking for more, the rowers made a binding commitment to ask one goal-focused question for every decision. That question changed their unity, their budget, their schedules, and the outcome of the gold medal. Their question, will it make the boat go faster? I've paraphrased that into my own focus question before the Lord. Day after day with my calendar open, my bank account open, my heart open, I regularly ask God, will it fulfill the Great Commission command, go and share the gospel? <laughs> the effects have been life-changing and life-giving. Before I knew little about a cross-cultural conversation or how to even begin a conversation, I had no idea how to talk about Jesus with those of world religions, but once I committed to obedience, I found training, like the one your pastor just mentioned that's on your schedule, and joined fellow believers, learning together and going out together to see God at work. Something I didn't even know was possible at my age, I now have a four-minute testimony that has prepared me to always be ready to speak my story. I go out to walk, and now I can talk about Jesus with my retired neighbors. Because I ask, the restaurant server shares her broken heart and welcomes prayer. And everywhere I go in our community, I see international faces happy to hear a word of welcome. Joining God already at work. And oh, don't get me started on how my spending has changed. Instead of forever saving money, I'm excited to spend God's money investing in his urgent work, the rescue of human souls. God's word in preaching and worship in church is kicking me out the door each week. God sending me retired, looking forward to Medicare, widowed, nervous, weak so he can be strong to join him in taking the gospel to right fields of harvest that are out there. I'll close by celebrating. You are here today in church worshiping because something of this gospel is already planted in your heart. But my recent experience serves as a warning. It is quite possible to be in church talking about church, yet fail to obey God's clear, go out there and share Jesus' command. He asked each of us, whom shall I send? Who will go for me? What is your answer? Isaiah said, here am I, send me. That answer will bring you into life-changing obedience as you experience God in the full adventure of knowing and doing his will out there where lost hearts are looking for him every single day. Thank you. Yazidis are part of Armenian society. They were persecuted and genocided in north of Iraq, in Syria, by ISIS. And the only homeland for them is Christian Armenia. And they are now in Armenia, and you 
or through this partnership building, uh, church building for them, which will be center for the education. So this why thank you, Norkana Baptist, being part of this EZD church building and educational project. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, we have a desire to have a church building. It's such a blessing to know that our prayers are being answered through this partnership. Our goal is to have Kurdish school so that children from my nation, the Kurds, can come to Christ. We would like to serve the Lord and do more to be an example for the Yazidi Kurdish people in this community that they would come to know Christ as well. For that we glorify God and we humble ourselves before Him. Two years ago, I stood in an empty field with a vision in mind for a church to be in that field. Two years later, that video just showed you the church that is now in that empty field. North Carolina Baptists are busy in Armenia. I also sat in that living room behind the table that had that white tablecloth on it and encouraged and preached the gospel to that small house church encouraging them to see the Lord's vision and desiring for the Lord to work in their lives and the lives of their community. It is the Yazidi people group, in which is one of the unreached people groups in this world. They have very little access to the gospel, but yet, through the partnership with NC Baptist and Armenia, the gospel is starting to flourish in this small community. Church, I want to let you know that I am going back to Armenia the first part of September. I encourage you to be praying for me as well as the team that is going. The first time I went, I didn't ask for any financial help, but I'm going to ask if you would like to do otherwise than just pray. If you would like to give to this trip, please do so. Come talk to me and let me know what that may look like. But I, along with six other pastors, are going to have the opportunity to go down and do a pastor's conference with the pastors of Armenia, as well as minister to a special group of pastors from the south which don't have any other training whatsoever because of where they live. I encourage you to pray for those people. I encourage you to pray for North Carolina Baptists as we seek to make God's word known not only in this community, and in this state, in this country, but throughout the world. I encourage you to partner not only with me, but with North Carolina Baptists as we seek to do that. I'm going to again ask for a word of prayer before Rich leads us in worship. Thank you again, Father, for Priscilla's testimony, for the mighty work you were doing in her heart, stirring her up not only to, to know what you were doing, but desire to be a part of what you were doing. God, let us as a church not be content with just coming to Sunday morning, but Lord, let us see where you are at work and then desire to be in and part of that work. Guard our hearts from complacency. Guard our hearts from cultural Christianity. And put in us a desire to make your name known in our families, in our friends' lives, and in our communities. Do it, Lord, as we are willing vessels unto your service. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let's stand.
This morning, I'm going to be reflecting on this somewhat on this past bi uh, week's Bible reading as we finish up Second Chronicles and move into Ezra during this coming week. Uh, as I was sitting down yesterday afternoon preparing to try to get my thoughts together uh, as to what I was going to say this morning or comment, I was thinking. I wish I had my notes from two weeks ago when I was up here and did this to give me some idea as to uh, how I went about it and what I possibly said, but I, could, I did, didn't remember what I did with them, couldn't find them. Uh, so I went ahead and prepared some comments for this morning. But then this morning when I sat down and was going to read the Sunday school lesson this morning and open my Sunday school book, I found the notes from two weeks ago. So uh, some of it's going to be similar to what we said. And as my friend, Dr. E Mickey Eford would say, who taught at the Duke Divinity School for uh, over 40 years, uh, his comment would be as he leaned his elbow on the podium and put his chin in his hand, he would say, and I know every one of you remember what I said two weeks ago. <laughs> so we're going to proceed on, uh, for this week's comments as we, as I said, finish up with Second Chronicles uh, chapters 13 through 36. And again, as I said two weeks ago, this is, uh, this is going to be a retelling of First and Second Samuel in first and second kings. At this time, Israel is divided is a divided nation, with Judah being the southern part and the northern part referred to as Israel. This period amazingly lasted for approximately four hundred years. Just think about that. Four hundred years. That's an extremely long period of time. And during that time, it, it consisted of many kings, most of which 
uh, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and even the ones that did good and were blessed by God, eventually, unfortunately, let pride and their success get in the way of, of what they did. Some even killed their own family members to become king. Others sacrificed their own children. There were many wars that occurred during this period of time. In most cases, sons succeeded their fathers to the throne. Some of the most evil kings had sons follow them that did good in the sight of the Lord and were blessed by God for what they did. But eventually, unfortunately, pride would overcome them and they would forget God's blessings and start doing evil. And when we get start having success ourselves, and uh, we have to be uh, quite aware that we don't let pride and success get in our way and that we not forget uh, to give credit to where our success comes from. We need to remember God and remember our, our blessings. One thing that, that I took away from this week's reading was if you seek to God, seek to follow God, you will be blessed. But if you do evil, God does not bless that, just as we saw in the readings this week. This past Wednesday morning at Bible study, a lady, we were talking about some of the happenings and things going on in this world. And one of the ladies made this comment, are you surprised? Because Satan is busy on a continual basis in this world uh, trying to get us to do evil and not to follow what God would want us to do. So stand strong in your faith, and when you do face trials, don't turn away from God. Turn to Him. See these times as opportunities for you to turn to Him. In closing the comments this morning, Josiah was one of the last great kings of Judah. And one of the things that he did was to clean up and to restore the temple at that time. In the process, he found the scroll which contained the scriptures, which had been lost for many years, and they had not had the opportunity to read them. In reality, if we don't pick up the Bible and read, it's the same thing as those lost scriptures. No benefit to us. So we need to pick up the Bible and read it on a daily basis to enrich and strengthen our knowledge in God. In 586 B.C., the kingdom of Persia took over. They and the few that remained were taken as exiles to Babylon. So that ends the readings of Second Chronicles, and again, we'll be moving into Ezra this coming week. When Eric asked me a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, would I do the Bible reflections for the month of May, I thought, hmm, I'm going to need some help on this. Uh, for me, just reading the Bible, uh, sometimes it confusing and I don't understand it and maybe don't get that much out of it. So we had a Bible at home. It's the Life Application Study Bible. So I turned to that and started reading it during this month as I prepared for uh, doing the Sunday morning reflections. And it's been amazing what revelations that I've come across as I've read that. Uh, not, it's got 
lots of footnotes and explanations that really enlightened what I had read and helped me understand what it was saying. So hopefully you are doing your in the Bible on a daily basis reading. But if you're like I am, sometimes have difficulties understanding what it's saying, I would encourage you to seek out the Life Application Study Bible. It, it, it's been very helpful for me, and I'm sure it probably would be to you. So let us close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word. We're thankful that we have the opportunity to open the Bible and read it, open our hearts and help us to understand it and help that understanding lead us as we go forth and share your good news with those we come in contact with and just help it to strengthen our faith in you. We thank you for all your blessings. These things I pray in Christ's name. Amen.
you will, turn in your Bibles. I just like coming and appearing today. Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to look at verses 36 through 46. And I desired to read this passage today and hustle down from upstairs for a very specific point. John does not elaborate on the garden like the other three Gospels do. And so I really want you to pay attention to the passage today. The passage generally ties in to what I preach on, but this one specifically will today, because we're going to talk about much of what Matthew and Luke write, because John simply doesn't write about it. So in Matthew 26, picking up in verse 36, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with them Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed and into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Up in the uh, sound booth, if you can move it to uh, In the Garden. Let's stand and sing In the Garden.
for this day. We just pray that everything that we do might be honoring to you. We pray that the money that we provide through tithes and offerings will be used to further your kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Again, I think the kids have exited. If you would like to go, see there's another one leaving right now. Yep. If you would like to go to, you're welcome to head on out. Karis, you can rock it out too. Sit that on up the front there. Thank you. Um, let's pray. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this day. Man, for your goodness, for your grace, for your church. Let us be excited about the work that you are doing in our lives. And I pray, Lord, that we would get on board with the work that you desire to do in the future. God, guide us through the power of your word today. And as we wrestle with Jesus, as he's in the garden. And we, we apply that to our own lives. Lord, give us the strength to do hard things. Give us the strength to pursue your will above our own desires. Man, that's hard. God, guide us today. Let your word move within our hearts and our minds. Challenge us in a way that only you can, help us to hear from the Holy Spirit in a way that only those that can call on your name can. God, and I pray that if there's somebody here that doesn't know you, or touch their heart, help them see that Jesus agonized over the cross because he loves them, and that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. And it was because this agony and his desire to go through with your call in his life that we now have salvation. Bring that good news into somebody's heart today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. As I was thinking about the sermon, as I was planning on Wednesday, we wrote in the title, Into the Garden. And that does exhibit what we're looking at today. Jesus going into the garden. But as I, as I mulled over the message, as I, thought, as, I thought, uh, as I thought through it, I kind of wish I had renamed it Hard Things. Hard Things. Because I feel like that applies more to our life right now and puts into a better perspective this passage. And the way this passage can be then applied to our lives. Hard things. Do you do hard things? Are you willing to do hard things for the Lord? Some of y'all right now are wrestling because it's 1148 
And this is the latest I've ever got into the pulpit before. Hard things for some of you, unfortunately, is staying in church past 12. Just to be honest, I mean, I remember growing up in the Presbyterian church, and man, it was 11 to 12. And if it looked like it was going over 12, man, I started getting antsy. I was like, man, I'm ready to go. It's supposed to be over at 12. It's 5 till, and he's still preaching. What are we doing? I was in churches before at 12 o'clock on the dot. Beep, 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 beep. You know those folks with the alarm, the digital alarm clock that has their alarm set so the pastor knows it's 12 o'clock. And it's, if he's not wrapped up yet, he better be wrapped up. Well, let me go ahead and tell you, go ahead and turn your alarms off because it is going to go past 12 today. Hard things, church. Hard things. If this is something you're wrestling with, then you're de definitely not. I'm going to tell you, you're definitely not dealing with hard things. If a hard 12 o'clock hour for you to get out of church is something that bothers you, you're not dealing with hard things. That's what I have to as a pastor and the, we as a church have to wrestle with when we think about hard things. The things that we set up in our mind as boxes for God, like a 12 o'clock finish time, if we can't get past that, then we're never going to deal with hard things out there. The hard things that God is challenging us to do, like share our faith with complete strangers, like write a check for gospel work rather than buying our own selves something that we desire. Sacrificing our time to step into an arena that is uncomfortable for us when we would much rather be sitting on our couch. We talked about this morning the, the detriment of live streaming and how easy it is to sit at home on your couch rather than get up, put on your clothes, and come to church. Hard things, right? I want to challenge us this morning that those aren't hard things. That those things are easy. And that Lord God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one that puts salvation in your heart is desiring for you to wrestle with truly hard things. As we see Christ wrestle in the garden with hard things, we too must wrestle with hard things. And to encourage you, church, because we have done some wrestling in the last three and a half years. Oh my, some of y'all can say that we have. Because this church is doing some things that are completely different than what y'all were doing three and a half years ago. If you're visiting today and you don't happen to know, there are five churches worshiping today. Three languages being preached today in this church. We are sharing graciously our space with 250 other people today. For some of y'all, that's hard things. Because this was your church three and a half years ago. God calls us to more. God calls us to him as his children, desiring to see his glory and not our comfort. We must wrestle with that on a daily basis. So let's look at this. Y'all heard 26 verses last week, I think, and I was like, I should have divided it up. Well, today you're getting two. John 18, verses 1 and 2. When Jesus had spoken these words... He went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. That's it. That's all John says about the garden. Many of y'all know the story of the Garden of Gethsemane, the story that I read from Matthew, the, the passage at the top of your bulletin from Luke that talks about Jesus sweating drops of blood because he is praying in earnest. John just says they go to the garden. Next thing we know, he's getting arrested. Why didn't John talk about it more? Well, many people believe that John was one of the last Gospels written, and he knew that the folks, Matthew, Luke, Mark, had already covered the point. It was already written down. He didn't necessarily need to talk about it. John covers things in quite a bit of different detail than the other three Gospels. We're going to see that he includes things in his arrest that are not in other Gospels. So he doesn't elaborate on the garden. He chooses just to say they went to the garden, and we see a snippet about Judas. And so 
I want us to think, though, this morning about gardens. What does a garden make you think of? When we mention the term garden, one of the first things that comes to my mind, we, I'm from Durham, I grew up in Rougemont, y'all know that, and one of the, the things that strikes me immediately is Duke Gardens. I went to Duke Gardens growing up. Karis loves going to Duke Gardens. Duke Gardens is one of the most fascinating things on the campus at Duke. It is beautiful. It is a, it is a place of peace and calm and serenity. Many of you have gardens at home, whether it's rose gardens or vegetable gardens or other kinds of gardens. You, you grow things. You take pride in that. You put a lot of time into those things. And gardens hold significance for many of us. I grew up again in, in a rural context, and we had a garden every year. And I can remember spending time in the garden weeding and planting, and Dad's probably like, no, we didn't. He did all those things, right? And then refusing to eat what was grown in the garden because it was all gross, right? Give me chicken nuggets and french fries or pizza. And then watching my mom take that produce and can it. Like the garden was a significant part of our life. And for many of us, as we, as we think about and reflect on this, this kind of topic of a garden, we think of growth, we think of peace and quiet, of passion, of beauty. For many of us, gardens are significant. But I want to paint a different picture of a garden this morning. The garden in which we find Jesus and his disciples stepping into. And for Jesus, the garden was different. It was a place of escape, a place of prayer, of connection, of respite, and of sorrow. I want us to wrestle with those emotions, those feelings, those activities as we think about Jesus and his disciples gathering the night of his arrest. You see, he's, he's just spent, I would imagine, at least a couple hours pouring into his disciples after the Last Supper. We spent the last several chapters of John talking about those last exhortations that he gave his disciples preparatory words to prepare them for when he was going to leave and no longer be with them, that he was going somewhere new, and as he left, he was going to send the Holy Spirit. He wanted them to be ready, as ready as at least they could be. And then he spent all of chapter 17 praying, praying for himself, praying for his disciples, and praying for all of us, the believers that were to come. He ends on prayer, and it says he gathered his disciples after speaking these words, and they went out. What an encouragement you would have to think for these disciples to end the night in a season of passion prayer with the creator of the universe, with their Messiah, their rabbi they have spent the last three years walking with, the Lord of creation, praying for him and them. What a powerful, enduring moment. And after they finish praying, he gathers his disciples up and they leave the upper room and they head to this garden. Jesus knows. You have to wrestle with this fact that Jesus knows what's coming. Jesus knows what the plan is. Jesus could have turned around, y'all. Think about that. Jesus could have said, no, nope, that's good. Let's go, disciples. Let's go do something else. I don't want to go. Let's handle this a different way. But Jesus doesn't turn around. He knows he could, but he doesn't. John, again, skips much of the details that I read in Matthew. And Luke gives us one of the scenes that is enduring. John gives us a few simple details. But I want us to wrestle with the the passages in Matthew and Luke today as we We look at Jesus and we think about Jesus and what the significance of him is walking out of the upper room with his disciples and walking into the garden and what the garden symbolizes. And John paints this picture of us in verse 2. He says, now Judas who betrayed him, he also knew of the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. Judas has already been long gone. Jesus said, go ahead and leave. Go do what you're going to do and do it quickly. And Judas goes and is ready to betray Jesus. But Judas also knows where Jesus is going to be. 
is not a detail that has just slipped in there. I think John tells us this for a very specific purpose. You see, Jesus has gone to the garden frequently, and Jesus frequently takes his disciples with him. This is not the first time that Jesus has brought them along with him to the garden. They know this place well, because Jesus knows this place well. He's been there before. Judas has been there before. The disciples have been there before. Many of them probably already have a preconceived notion of what's going to take place that evening. Because they've been there, done that. They're going to gather with Jesus and they're going to pray and maybe they're going to rest. Maybe they're going to sleep as we see the disciples doing. But this time is different. Judas isn't with them this time. But Judas knows where they are. And Judas has a point to knowing Jesus goes to the garden, and we're going to see Judas also head to the garden, but they both have different intentions. Jesus comes to pray and comes to warn. He tells his disciples, don't fall into temptation. Judas comes to turn over and to betray, sealing his betrayal with a kiss, showing the arresting officers that this is indeed him, the one that I am kissing. Different intentions, different wrestling, different reaction to hard things. We must grapple with Jesus' desire to step into hard things. The details that we don't see in John's gospel is the prayer and the wrestling, the submission and the desire, the seeking, pleading, the encouragement, the sleeping, the blindness, the uncertainty. All these things are emotions and actions that are taking place in this short time in the garden. Jesus goes like he has gone so many times before this to pray, to connect simply with his Father. I want you all to recognize this for a minute. I say Jesus goes into the garden to wrestle with his father, to pray with his father. We, again, in America have a misconception of prayer. We have a lax view of prayer, I want to tell you that. We don't understand what it means when Jesus goes into the garden and prays like he does. He's not passively praying. Y'all get that? We do so much passively. We watch TV passively. We sit at the table and eat passively. We drive passively. We scan our phones passively. So much of what we do is done in the comfort of our couch or our chairs or our homes or our cars. It takes really very little engagement on our parts. I've driven long trips before, and there's sometimes I'll be three hours into a trip, and I'm like, man, where have I been the last three hours? That I'm so disengaged with driving, I'm so passive in my driving, that I'm just going on cruise control. Cars on cruise control, and my mind is on cruise control. That is how we actively go through most of our days, if we're completely honest with ourselves. And that is honestly how much of our time in prayer is spent. Passively, not really thinking about it, not putting much effort into it. But as we look at the passage in Matthew, and we look at the description that Luke paints, Jesus' prayer is a whole body involvement. There is emotional depth to it. There is true seeking of his Father. I'm going to challenge you, when was the last time that you got that on your hands and knees and prayed? Again, I've told you all that about Roy. It's one of the unique things about Roy. Every, I don't remember what days he worked, but he worked a couple of days a week. And when I was here with him, and me and Michael and Roy were in our office, and before we left for the day, we would get down on our hands and knees on the chairs in his office, and we would pray. And I would be honest with you, that was one of the first times that a pastor ever invited me to my hands and knees to pray. It was a different experience. And I will be honest with you, I have become mighty complacent in my prayer life at times. Mighty passive, I guess I should say, not complacent. Pray. 
but it's more passive. I got down on my hands and knees this week, church, because I was wrestling with this passage. I felt convicted that I needed to do more, to engage more in prayer. We're going to contrast Jesus' sweating of blood, asking the cup to pass. He says this three times, Father, if this cup can pass, there's any other way, let there be a different way. With such emotion, such pressure, such stress on his body that he is sweating tears of blood. I don't know about y'all, but I've never prayed that fervently. I don't know if I've ever really been brought to tears by prayer, to be honest with you. I'm not much of a crier. But there should be emotion in my prayers. There should be times in my life I feel like that I should be encountering Christ so deeply in prayer that it brings me to weep. I lack emotion when I go before the Father, as does, I would surmise, at least 95% of the church. Hard things, church. Are you willing to pray as Christ prayed? That's the first step. If you're not even willing to, pa- to actively engage in prayer, are you willing to do the hard things that Christ is calling you to? If you're not willing to get off your couch and get down on your hands and knees, are you willing to go out and share the good news of the gospel with the lost? I'm, I'm preaching to myself, y'all. I am. I am. This message has been just as much wrestling for me as I hope it is for you. Because I don't like hard things. I don't. I don't think anybody would get up in the morning and say, Lord, put hard things in front of me today. We don't. That is not our mentality. Jesus asked the Lord, if there is any other way, let this cup pass from me. We know the end of this. The cup doesn't pass. And as we think about that challenge, as Christ is pleading with his Father, that gives us no right then to diminish the cross. If there was any other way, Jesus asked three times, and I believe if there was another way for us to receive salvation, God would have provided it. Because he loved his son. He desired for his son to have the best. But he also knew what had to happen. And if that was the only way, then we can never approach our salvation in a way in which we could be good enough. If we could be good enough, then why did Christ have to go to the cross? I've heard that argument numerous times from the world. I'm good enough. I've done enough good things in my life that God will let me into heaven. If that was the case, then surely the cup could have passed from Christ. But that wasn't the case. We can't say that there's other ways to heaven apart from Jesus if the cup couldn't pass. We wouldn't have to really worry about those seeks back behind us because there's other ways, right? They're good. They're worshiping in their own way, right? No, the cup could not pass. The cup could not pass. The hard things had to be done. There is no other way, no matter what the world tells you, that there are many ways to get to heaven. There are not. It is Christ and Christ alone. Jesus would have never had to go to the garden if there was another way. He could have skipped the hard things. Think about that, church. Think about the effort that Christ was putting into his prayer. The agony, the asking, the emotion. And then we look at the disciples. We look at the disciples and it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart because they're missing such a pivotal moment in the life of Christ, the connection with him and the Father but it breaks my heart because I, as well as many of you, find ourselves in the same circumstances and situation as the disciples do. The disciples are falling asleep. Each and every time Christ comes back, they're asleep. They need constant prompts. It feels like me with my kids. That's what Carrie said this morning. She's like, oh my goodness, the kids were just not listening. Three times I had to ask them to put their shoes on. And they didn't do it. Three times Christ asked the disciples to pray with him, and they didn't do it. We are just like the kids, y'all. 
We are. Over and over again, Christ continues to command and love and disciple. And yet, they, like us, tend to fall asleep. We relate, I relate, more to the disciples than I do to Christ. That is why I need a Savior, y'all. That is why I need somebody to take my place, because I can't do it. The disciples were tired. How many of y'all feel tired? They lacked focus. How many of y'all lack focus when it comes to prayer? They put themselves in places of comfort. What do you mean, pastor, they put themselves in the place? They were in the garden with Jesus. They were at least comfortable enough to fall asleep. They probably took their little blow-up mattress with them, the little fan they plugged into the outlets, had their cup of ice water, took a few sips, and laid their mat out, and Jesus, you go down there, and we'll stay right here, okay? I'll catch up with you in a little bit. Come back and wake me up right when you're done, right? Went to sleep. They at least put themselves in a position where they were comfortable enough to fall asleep. How many times do we sit down to read maybe scripture or a good book? We put ourselves in a nice comfy chair, we recline it back, and three pages in and the book's on your chest and you're out cold. How many times maybe you sat down to pray and you closed your eyes? Maybe you didn't fall asleep, but your mind drifted to what's for dinner or where am I going for my next vacation or I wonder what my grandkids are doing or what do I have to do tomorrow morning? Oh, what do I need to get at the grocery store that I forgot today? We lack focus. We lack desire to connect with the Father church I am just as guilty oftentimes I am tired that I find myself when I go down to, or to sit down to pray I find myself asleep trying to wake myself up well enough drink enough coffee in order to connect with God I'm not willing to do the hard things I know what I need to do I need to get off the couch I need to get out of the chair I need to get on the floor, I need to get on my hands and knees, I need to ask the Father to come into my heart, to bring me to life, to take me out of the place of comfort so I am ready to do hard things. But I, just like many of you, like comfort too much. Comfort draws us in, it lures us, it is simply the devil getting a foothold in. I don't need to do that today. God's not calling me to do that. I don't need to visit that person. That person looks like they probably already know Jesus. I don't need to share with him today. I don't need to go to that area of town because I might encounter lost people. Whatever our excuses are, they're there and they keep us in our places of comfort. I've got something to do on that disciple-making training weekend. I just, I just can't cancel it. Can't do it. Eric's only told me this for a month. That's okay, though. Something else has come up. I'm not going to go. Because if I learn how to make disciples, or if I learn how to witness, that means that I've got to go do it, right? So I'm just going to skip that. June 22nd, let me see what I can come up with between now and then so I don't have to go serve. I like to be at church on Sundays, not Saturday. I've got lots of things I could do Saturday. I better go and do those things rather than go serve. Or encourage people with the gospel. Christ is calling us to hard things, church. He is. And I encourage you to ask and walk in those hard things. Jesus is clear. He, he tells the disciples as he comes back, he says, look, the flesh is weak. But the spirit is willing. Got to continue to remind ourselves of that. The flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. Do you allow the spirit that he has promised to come into your life to work, to propel you into the hard things, to rearrange your life? And so you start asking, does this impact my ability to spread the gospel? That's what Priscilla said this morning. Rearrange your values rather than saying, does this activity or spending or action or use of my time please me or further the spread of the gospel? That is our challenge today, church. 
I encourage each of you to enter into prayer as Jesus does in this passage. Prepare yourself for what God wants to do in your life. And I guarantee you it's not always what we want. We see Jesus repeatedly asking, let the cup pass. If there's any way, let it pass. Not what Christ wanted, but what he wanted in order to glorify the Father. That is where we must ask, does this make much of the Father and less of me? Are we seeking the kingdom first rather than ourselves? And we're about to sing a song called, Seek Ye First. Search for God, know his ways, and declare his glory. Desire kingdom growth over your comfort. Jesus says, knock and the door will be opened. Are we truly seeking Christ in our life? And a challenge for us today is to not be satisfied with transfer growth or just growth of the church in general. Yes, I want to see new people come. Yes, I want to see the numbers of people sitting in these pews get bigger. But there's things that are more important. Let's just say we had 150 people show up today. We could pat ourselves on the back and say, look at what God did. Look at all these people sitting in the pews. But that's not a testimony to the church, y'all. A testimony to the church is how healthy is the church. Are you growing in your understanding of Jesus? Are you doing hard things Monday through Saturday? Not just showing up to church on Sunday. Is discipleship happening? Are lost souls being saved? Are people that didn't know the gospel on Monday know the gospel on Tuesday? Because of the work that you were doing. Or the work that we are doing as a church. I pray that God gives us courage to do hard things. Jesus certainly did. This is evidence, and we're going to continue to talk about these hard things because it doesn't end in the garden. Y'all all all know that. It doesn't end in the garden. Thank God it doesn't. Because he went to the cross so that we can have life, and then in that life he challenges us to do those hard things. And I, believe me, church, believe me, you can. You can do hard things. There are some people that have gotten up here at this pulpit and shared about their Bible reading that otherwise would never have gotten in front of an audience because they trusted God to use them and speak through them. Y'all, some of y'all have been in this church for decades, and y'all have let so many groups come so the gospel can be furthered in this community without complaint, without asking for things in return. Y'all are coming to Sunday school, to community groups, in higher numbers than probably most other churches experience. Over 50% of y'all are coming and engaging with each other, doing life with Christ together. Y'all are doing hard things. Continue to do and ask God to do things that are beyond our understanding and imagination. Christ wants to change this community through the work of this church and through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in each of you, allow him to do it. Let's pray. Thank you, God, so much for this time. Thank you for the truth in your word, for the power of the garden. God, let us us search for you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Let us desire to connect with you and desire then to do your will. Press into us those hard things you desire for each of us to do and us as a church to do. Strengthen us, disciple us, help us to walk alongside of us, admonishing when we need to, but lifting up and equipping always. Guide us, Lord, into those hard things. Let us not walk with a sense of timidity or fear, but recognize we serve and can call on the creator of all things. And in you we have hope and life and salvation Grace unlimited, let us go forth being ready to share and spread that grace. In Christ's name I pray, amen. The altar is open. If you want to pray this morning, let me come pray with me. Get down on your hands and knees this morning and pray. And I challenged y'all several, probably over a year ago, to come to the front and pray. Y'all filled this altar up, hands and knees, praying to God. This morning, come up here and get down on your hands and knees and ask the Lord the hard things that he's calling you to. And ask him 
to let you surrender your comfort so that you may do those hard things. Let's stand. praying if you still would like to have a time of prayer come on come on i'm going to close this in prayer and then you may be dismissed thank you father thank you so much thank you for your love your grace your kindness thank you for what you are doing at this church god my heart overflows it does but it is also challenged it's also challenged by the depth of your call on our lives as believers we are indeed called to pick up that cross daily to seek your will above our will. May that be said of us. May that be true of this church and of your people. Guide us into deep, abiding relationship with you just as we saw Christ exhibit in the garden. Guide us, Lord, as we seek to go tell the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have a blessed day, Bragtown, and go tell the world.